The date is the 23rd of April, 1967, the time just striking 3 a.m. The Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan is bustling with activity, preparing for the Soviet Union's first manned spaceflight since the Voskhod 2 mission in 1965. This foray into the cosmos lies under the designation Soyuz 1. An air of unease, even trepidation, hangs over many of the Baikonur controllers, engineers, and crew. Political pressure from the Kremlin had forced them to execute the launch of Soyuz 1 as scheduled, to the indignation of Vladimir Mikhailovich Komarov. Komarov was a superlative engineer and was exceedingly competent at learning and handling the various controls, functions, and requirements of the Soyuz craft. This due to his extensive experience with Vostok and Voskhod missions. Gagarin touted him as one of the most brilliant pilots and engineers he'd ever worked with. This was most likely why he was the primary selection for the Soyuz 1 mission, as this was expected to be the most taxing flight compared to the sister launch of the Soyuz 2. Komarov was chosen to be the primary cosmonaut for the Soyuz's first spaceflight, and of his own volition had elected to retain this position despite fully knowing that Soyuz was woefully underprepared and fraught with technical issues. Led by an underfunded and constantly pestered engineering team, that was initially headed by Sergei Karalyov. Karalyov was described by the engineer Sergei Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev's son, as a man that was not a scientist, was not a designer, but a brilliant manager. His approach, as Khrushchev states, was Let's not work by stages, as is usual in spacecraft design, but let's assemble everything and then try it, and at last it will work. This approach and the precedent it set for Karalyov's successor meant that unlike NASA, the Soviet program would be hard-pressed to individually test and vet parts of spacecraft. Following his death in 1966, a successor by the name of Vasily Mishin was selected. By all accounts, a competent engineer, he had inherited a program that had been severely sidelined in terms of budgetary attention due to the Soviet space program lagging behind that of the US. Exacerbating this, Mishin was not known for his tactful political maneuvering or his compliant nature. In fact, quite the opposite. He was considered quite the thorn in the side of the Politburo due to his stubbornness and adherence to logic and only logic, and not necessarily the party line. This almost certainly reduced funding due to an acerbic relationship with the Politburo. These issues became the background for an extremely tumultuous development phase, with the complicated hierarchy and bureaucracy of the Soviet space program only adding to the Soyuz's development issues and political pressure from the Kremlin further straining the abilities of the program's engineers and scientists. The extent of this bureaucracy is quite neatly summarized by the creation of the Council for the Problems of Mastering the Moon, which was a congregation of ministers, scientists, and academics. It was rumored that the only reason this council was created was so that various people could extricate themselves from any responsibility of cosmonautic failure. Approaching the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, Leonid Brezhnev, the incumbent general secretary of the Soviet Union, demanded that Mishin and his team work to make Soyuz ready for April of 1967, where two spacecraft would dock in orbit in celebration. The successful Gemini program conducted by NASA further galvanized the political ire of the Politburo. A Soviet must fly before the terminus of Gemini was the general consensus. The already disadvantaged team of scientists and engineers who now lack the mind of Sergei Karalyov now only had an excess of one year and a half to identify and tackle all of the issues with a Soyuz program. This deadline weighed heavily on the minds of Soviet engineers, with Mishin later stating, truly, there never was a time when we worked in peace without being hurried or pressured from above. The unskilled, totally bewildered, high-ranking bureaucrats believe that they are fulfilling their duties if they are shouting, let's go, let's go, at the people who don't even have time to wipe the sweat off their brows. Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space and a close friend of Vladimir Komarov, understood that without more time and resources, the operation would most likely be disastrous. As such, he used his connections on two occasions 
to highlight the issues plaguing the Soyuz program to the Kremlin. The first instance being in October of 1965, pleading with Brezhnev's disciples at the Kremlin to address numerous problems with the cosmonautics program, including lack of funding, immensely complicated management, and a focus on automated technology, despite repeated requests to defeat American counterparts in human piloted missions. The second instance was in 1966, and was Gagarin's most fruitless and dejecting. Operating under the knowledge that Soviet leadership had already selected Kamarov for the mission, he made one final plea to a KGB contact at the dreaded Lubyanka, asking him to pass a document up the chain of command detailing all 203 problems the Soyuz spacecraft possessed. All involved in this process, save Gagarin, were either exiled to Siberia, demoted or fired, presumably as this was seen as an attempt to undermine Brezhnev's supreme authority on all matters. This meant that not only was Kamarov still going to man the Soyuz craft in April, but that he would have to do so with most of the current problems still afflicting it. One engineer that worked on the spacecraft noted that a month before the launch was scheduled to take place, testing phases still yielded critical issues with the craft. He stated that more time was needed to make it operational, but the Communist Party ordered the launch despite the fact that four preliminary launches had revealed faults in coordination, thermal control, and parachute systems. This state of affairs severely affected Gagarin, as his friendship with Kamarov since they were selected to be part of the cosmonaut program in 1959 had developed into an adamantine camaraderie, with Kamarov becoming a quasi-father figure to Gagarin and developing a supremely protective nature. The two battled at length about who would man the craft, but Kamarov refused to acquiesce. He made it explicitly clear that he would not step down from the task of flying the aircraft when he had invited Vinyamin Rusayov, Gagarin's KGB contact, to dinner. Here, Kamarov revealed that he believed he would not return from the mission, and when asked about whether or not he would resign, he stated that if he resigned, it was possible that Gagarin would take his place. Gagarin must be protected, he said, and thus effectively consigned himself to an early grave. Thus, the gridlock at the Kremlin and the sheer indifference to the imperiled Kamarov and an equally distressed and sequestered Gagarin resulted in the flight commencing as scheduled on April 23, 1967. Whatever may have been flowing through Kamarov's mind at this point did not prevent him from preparing extensively for the journey. He was described to have worked so incredibly hard that it appeared that he may not be fit for flight. With no relief to be expected, and as the dread-consumed days passed, Kamarov made his peace and prepared for that fateful flight into the cosmos. On the day, the 22nd of April, 1967, he arrived early in the morning, conducted standard meetings with personnel, representatives, other flight crews and engineers for the rest of the day. At 11.30 that night, a murder of bureaucrats from the State Commission sank the nail into the coffin. Kamarov would fly for the glory of the USSR and in commemoration of the Russian Revolution. Kamarov awoke at around 1.30 in the morning and was very quickly covered in medical sensors and prompted onto a platform where he would give his final speech before liftoff. With the eerie vastness of the Kazakh steppes surrounding him, he marched towards 7K OK with an unexpected zeal, with Gagarin close behind him. He followed Kamarov all the way up to the craft's hatch and persisted until it was closed before him. Perhaps Gagarin, in a state of delusion, believed that there was a chance he might convince Kamarov to permit him to fly. More likely, he merely wanted to accompany a friend and provide his support until the end. Perhaps he knew it was now out of his control. He had already tried and failed to take Kamarov's place. With a somber farewell, Kamarov's aircraft lifted off at exactly 0335 hours on April 23rd in a mesmerizing display of searing hot flames and became the first man to venture into the unknown on two occasions. Almost immediately, Despite all the nominal clearance when the craft took off, there were already issues. 
As Komarov hurtled into the stratosphere and came to orbit, critical solar panels failed to deploy, resulting in power shortages to the vital systems. Komarov instantly wrestled to orient the craft correctly with reduced power, yet was unable to do so. The craft's altitude controls had been severely limited and according to reports Komarov had, in a desperate attempt, tried to dislodge the mechanism responsible for deploying the panel by kicking the side of the capsule. Gagarin was summoned to the control center and upon realizing that Komarov was in dire straits, he attempted to correct the issue with Komarov, yet nothing seemed to be working. Making things worse was the patchy properties of communication with the control center, and Komarov was essentially incapable of communicating with Soviet controllers during half of his orbit, as he was out of radio contact range. Due to this, he was ordered to get some rest and tackle the issue when he returned into the range. With the treacherous state of his craft, it is not likely that Komarov made any attempt to rest, and even if he had, it would have most likely been futile. On the 13th orbit, contact was once again established, and the status report had not altered. This was particularly worrying, as due to solar panel failure, the capsule was fast running out of power, with the backup batteries only allowing for another 10 orbits. Komarov's prospects were further culled when the Soyuz 2 craft, intended now for a rescue operation, was cancelled due to the severe weather. Further troubleshooting failed to hit the mark, and the control center was forced to utilize a procedure that had yet to be used in practice. Komarov expertly executed the suggestion with valiant precision in the face of overwhelming odds, orienting the craft manually and firing a retro burn putting him on course for a safe landing in the Soviet Union. Audio transmissions between Soyuz and the control center found Komarov to be exceptionally calm and professional. This would be the last transition the ground team would receive from Komarov and would be his last words heard by any man. Many at the control center, Gagarin and Komarov, breathed a sigh of relief, fully expecting that the worst was over. However, at this point, controllers were no longer able to establish contact with Komarov, so his status could not be verified. As Komarov sat in the center couch of Soyuz 1, hurtling towards the Earth, he would have realized, while controllers experienced a communication blackout, that the craft was not reducing its speed as it broke through the atmosphere. He would have deduced, quite correctly, that something had gone wrong with the parachutes. He would have been fully conscious as he saw his demise in the terrain fast approaching, only anticipating the devastating impact. Komarov may have felt terror, perhaps acceptance, perhaps nothing. Audio recordings could not be recovered and his last words remain a mystery. The final moments of a bright spark dashed by a cruel fate lost to the sands of time. Many speculate that he would have cursed those that forced him into the infernal death trap, but considering his resourcefulness, he would have likely struggled against adversity to the very end, desperately trying to save himself. Conjecture has led to an embellished version of Komarov's last minutes alive. It was claimed that an American listening post in Turkey picked up terror-filled roars from the Soviet cosmonaut as he came hurtling towards Earth. However, through extensive research of numerous space historians, it was determined that this was a falsified source and was heavily exaggerated, at the very least, and likely completely untrue. Komarov and the craft crashed into the Earth at 90 meters per second, instantly splitting the craft in two and igniting what was left of the fuel. Farmers and locals began to congregate at the scene and fruitlessly shoveled dirt on the wreckage to quell the flames. It would take many hours to confirm that Komarov was indeed dead, as his body had been reduced to nothing but a pile of charred flesh, bone, and ashes. After all of Komarov's effort, after his valorous execution, his successful attempt to remedy the failures of the aircraft had been rendered null by the failure of a parachute. Something so small, yet so crucial. The injury to insult. Soon, he would be reunited with his family, but not in the same manner as the Vaskhod mission three years prior. Valentina Kamarova would welcome home not a man, but a pile of ashes. And no medal, 
no state funeral, no perennial sentimentalism would ever return him. And years later, the very men that had sent Kamarov to his death would use his legacy as phalanx for political gain and patriotism. Kamarov had not reached the apex of his career before being quite literally wiped from the face of the earth by the obstinance of the Politburo and his defense of Gagarin. Gagarin was simply put, devastated. Kamarov had sacrificed his life to protect Gagarin, and he knew it. He traveled back to Moscow beside his comrade's coffin, likely cursing Brezhnev under his breath. His KGB contact Rusayov asserted that following the crash, Gagarin had a massive burden of guilt on his shoulders. Following Kamarov's death and his subsequent removal from all space flights and aviation, he began to drift. In the words of American space writer James Oberg, Gagarin transformed from a personable, cocky jet pilot into a demigod to be worshipped, emulated and protected from all risk and adventure, to a man that his peers described as undergoing a stormy personality disintegration. Perhaps as a way of coping with the tremendous anxiety associated with Kamarov's death, he started indulging in an incredibly party-heavy lifestyle. In an attempt to regain some autonomy in his life, Gagarin pushed heavily to have his piloting and spacefaring privileges restored, and was granted the former in February of 1968. Then, quite unexpectedly in March of 1968, less than a month after resuming to fly, Gagarin was killed during a training flight. The UTI MiG-15, manned by himself and test pilot Vladimir Seryogin, was sucked into a vortex of a passing unauthorized MiG-21, causing it to plummet towards the Earth in an uncontrolled spin. Gagarin and Seryogin managed to recover from the spin, but due to inaccurate data readings from faulty ground control stations, they overestimated their altitude by 200 to 300 meters, assuming that they were much higher than the actual 400 to 600 meters. This was further exacerbated by a thick cloud cover, obscuring visual readings. Subsequently, their aircraft hurtled towards the ground at a velocity of 700 to 800 kilometers per hour, at an attack angle of 70 degrees, giving them very little time to react and eject. Had readings been correct, had they had had a few hundred more meters of altitude, they would have been able to eject quite readily. Investigators found the remains of Gagarin, not quite unlike Kamarov, in a fiery inferno. <laughs>